And you're coming here with sort of good news, I guess, for people who have been following what you do. You could be launching your stable coin a bit faster than most people thought. Well, we've always been kind of consistent that we're going to launch, do everything we can to launch this year. Uh, everything Ripple does is in conjunction with regulatory approval, licensing, and so a key issue that we will continue to make sure we are partnered with U.S. regulators before we go live with the stablecoin. We'll first issue it, uh, we expect, in the U.S., but we think there's opportunity for stablecoins globally. And certainly Japan, as you, I think, probably know, they approved some legislation a year ago that came into effect this year. And so there's uh, a process underway now to do stable coins here in Japan as well. Yeah, I want to talk about that. But when we're talking about the U.S., we're talking about a matter of weeks for this launch. Yeah, our expectation has been to move as quickly as we can. Uh, it, you know, some people, I think, thought that might be the very end of the year. We won't know for sure until regulators say, yes, we have the green light. Uh, but we're optimistic. We acquired a company uh, called Standard Custody, which had a New York DFS trust license. And there's a process you go through to kind of transfer that and how it's going to be used. We've had a great partnership with the New York DFS, Defense Department of Financial Services, through a bit license we've had for many years. Uh, and we'll continue to partner with them and work through that with them before we go live. Tell us a little about the use case. How does this really differentiate from your token itself? Because that's also been talked about the payment system, right? Right. We've always used XRP, uh, the, the digital asset that's kind of native to our technology stack. We've used that as a bridge asset to transfer money across borders. What we have found is that stable coins, particularly U.S. dollar stable coins, has gone from a pretty small market to today it's about $170 billion worldwide. And People think that that may end up being two to three trillion in about five years. Given Ripple's place in the payments infrastructure, as well as a trusted brand partnering with financial institutions and regulators, we felt like there's an opportunity to enter the stablecoin market as that market continues to grow. We already have used stablecoins in our payment flows for certain corridors, depending upon whether you're going to the Australian dollar or the Philippine peso. Certain corridors, it's more efficient to use a stablecoin at times. So we always use what's best for the customer, and we decided to go live and build our own stablecoin and uh, excited to get live with that this year. Thinking of building a stablecoin here in Japan, I mean, you said that the regulations here were clearer, but at the same time, it's a more of a conservative market, no? You know, I think Japan has been a more conservative market in some ways, but I actually think that in some ways is also really healthy. Uh, Japan, more so than some countries around the world, leaned in early to provide regulatory clarity and pass legislation, both about stablecoins, but even further back, I think 2017 or 2018, the FSA here in Japan issued clarity and a kind of a taxonomy, a framework for how different cryptos would be regulated. And that has really allowed, I think, entrepreneurship and investment to thrive here in Japan. Now, as compared to the United States, which has really been behind the, mm. certainly Japan and the UK and behind Switzerland, so a lot of countries are leading, and Japan has been in many ways one. That's not to say they haven't been conservative about the regulation, but I think that can be really healthy. As long as there's clear rules of the road, entrepreneurs will work within them. So if you're imagining a stable coin in Japan, what's the time frame? Well... I think right now, Ripple in particular is focused on let's get live with the U.S. dollar stablecoin. Okay. But I think there will be people will want to hold yen stablecoins. And I think that's only a matter of time. And I think the regulators here in Japan, again, about a year ago, passed some legislation around that. And there's some companies going through the licensing process right now to get live. A lot of the companies that are involved in this space in Japan are larger corporations. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of a concern, not having the smaller, you know, innovative guys take the lead? Well, I think what you're seeing is some of the bigger guys partnering with the smaller mm. innovative companies. Uh, Ripple, way back in 2016, uh, partnered with SBI, one of the largest and most successful banking conglomerates here and you know, really across a lot of financial services here in Japan. And that's been a really successful partnership for us and for them. So uh, we feel like it makes sense for to, when you enter some of these markets to partner with some of the bigger guys. And that's true in Korea. That's true in Japan. Uh, Depending on what market you go into, we try to figure out what's the best way to enter. Especially here in Japan, we've talked about regulation being a bit more clear, but also the government has been very active in setting those regulations. At the same time, we're headed towards a presidential election for the ruling Liberal Democratic Party. Do you have any views on the potential that this market could change? Well, I, actually, while I've been here in Japan, I've met with regulators, I've met with the FSA, I've met with elected representatives, and it, what I've heard consistently is a desire to lean into these technologies. Uh, I think the, the environment here from a macro point of view has been very pro-innovation. 
And this helps create job growth. It helps, uh, I mean, even getting the economy kind of jump-started. And what has been a little bit deflationary, I think some of these assets can actually be used to address that and provide some balance and how pricing acro across different jurisdictions occurs. You're even encouraged as an outsider because some of these markets in Asia can tend to be very insular. Yeah, I think historically that's been my impression. I will tell you, I have felt incredibly warm welcomes across the board, you know, with the FSA, with elected representatives. They want to see technologies like this embraced and adopted, whether it's crypto and blockchain or AI. That's a consistent message I heard in all of my meetings over the last day or two. Does that really contrast to what you're feeling in the U.S., the warmth and embrace? <laughs> You know, it's a sad reality. You know, I mean, I, I, I chuckle about it, but it's frustrating. You know, I, I grew up in the United States. Uh, a majority of Ripple's employees are based in the United States today. But our, our number of employees we hire outside the United States has grown dramatically. I was going to say, how big is that? How big so we have about 900 employees globally. 75% mm -hmm. uh, of our hiring has been non-U.S., in part because of exactly what you're talking about. The U.S. has been pretty hostile towards crypto. Uh, the Biden administration, frankly, has taken a pretty negative view, and that has meant this kind of regulation through enforcement. The United States SEC has sued a lot of companies in the space. And rather than doing the hard work that the Japanese regulators have done of codifying and creating a, a framework, they've just sued people. That's not a really great way to regulate an industry. Do you think th that would change if we have the more overtly crypto-friendly Trump administration coming back in? Well, I don't know who's going to win. I think regardless of who wins, you're going to see new leadership uh, at the United States Security and Exchange Commission. And that will be, I think, an important uh, a ch changing of the guard. Now, uh, Trump and the Republicans clearly have leaned into being very pro-crypto. I view crypto and blockchain as a very bipartisan. It, you shouldn't care about a technology depending on what party you're from. I think being pro-innovation and pro-job growth makes sense on both sides of the aisle. So it's almost like saying I'm a Republican, I'm anti-email, but I'm a Democrat, I'm pro-email. Like that doesn't make sense. At it's least how for you the use time, them. At least for the time being, though, given that there is that lack of uh, clarity, given that, you know, they're pro and anti-email. <laughs> yeah. No US IPO. Uh, at least for now. No, we, we don't have any. Uh, that's not our horizon. We're frankly very lucky to have a very strong balance sheet. We've made acquisitions. We bought a custody company last year for 250 million U.S. dollars. We've done stock buybacks to our private shareholders. But going public in the United States when the SEC isn't a big fan of uh, crypto and certainly Ripple even specifically, I don't think that's in the cards. So soon. where is all of that money coming from? Like how much of that ratio comes from overseas, especially Asia? I don't know the exact ratio. Uh, I mean, we think about our business as a very global business. 95% uh, of our customers are non-U.S. customers. Mm -hmm. About 40% of our business is in the Asia-Pacific region in terms of payment flows. Mm -hmm. and again, our customers, Ripple, the company, our customers are banks, financial institutions, payment providers. We build, we use the XRP ledger, and we use the token XRP to kind of facilitate these transactions. Some people get confused about which is which, but you know, Ripple, the company, our, com our customers are all these banks and financial institutions.